Hey folks, uh, Dr. Phil here. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about in this video some of the basics of managerial accounting. So what is managerial accounting? So the first thing to understand is you can think of it as internal, all right? So like within the business itself. We think of financial accounting as outside the business. We think of managerial accounting as inside the business. So you can see here it says managerial accounting provides financial and non-financial information to an organization's managers. Okay, so what is the reason to take a managerial accounting class? Why, why do you need to understand this as part of a business or an accounting degree or finance or marketing? You tend to find managerial accounting in all of those, e economics too. Um, let me go back just a second, there we go. So these are some things that management accountants uh, may do. And a good way to summarize this is to think of it as we help to answer questions. So, for example, um, we're gonna, do we want to build a new factory? Do we want to develop new products? Do we wish to expand into new markets? Um, what about our costs? Do we have, are our costs too high? You know, how much does it cost us to build something? Obviously, that's pretty important, right? If you're trying to make money in a business, are services profitable? Are customers satisfied? So, these are all things that we can, you know, we can measure, we can quantify, we can, we can help ourselves understand more about our own business, things like margins, for example, you know, what products are making us the most money. Um, what about some career paths? So now look at some of these numbers down here. I mean, we're not saying that everybody's going to make, you know, 290,000 a year. Obviously, there's not a ton of CFO jobs around, but, um, you know, these are, these are average numbers. Um, it could be less or more depending on the area you live. Um, but what you will notice here is that like even a, you know, even a fairly entry level type job, you know, staff accountant, senior accountant, 60, 85,000, that's pretty, that's quite a bit more than most people are going to make right out of college. So the one thing I've always said about an accounting degree is, you know, the average accountant like tend to make more than the average lawyer. Um, and you know, good accountants, the ones with licenses, um, you know, advanced credentials, some of them may make more than doctors. But the great thing about accounting is you don't have to be in school forever. And, you know, you think about the average lawyer and doctor, you know, they've got typically, you know, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of, you know, student loans to bills to pay back. Whereas accountants, you probably have a fraction of that. So in terms of like ROI on your career, accounting is a really good way to go. It's a really good way to go. All right. First thing we need to talk about as far as the material goes um, direct versus indirect costs. So this is this is fairly straightforward. So direct costs um, are ones that we can easily trace to a what we call a cost object, right? So let me let me pick something here. So let's say that this candle right here, right? You can all see this candle, one of those wood wicks that make the kind of a burning noise when you burn them. So if we were making these, we might say, okay, what what is the direct cost of this? Let me get my head in there too. So we've got the glass. We've got the wick, we've got the, you know, the, the wax, of course. So, you know, those are the things that we know has got, have got to go into here. But we also know that those aren't the only things that we're going to incur, right? There's going to be, there's a factory, we're going to make these, we're going to be churning these candles out probably on some kind of production line. Um, so think about things like, you know, overhead, that we have to pay the electricity bill, the water bill, you know, the, the phone bill, the internet, so on and so forth. They've got all these bills that we, we're going to have, we, but we can't necessarily directly trace those to those candles, right? We know the glass for the candles, the, the wicks, you know, the, the wax itself. Um, yeah, those are easy, right? We know those go straight into that candle, but some of those things are a little more peripheral, if you will, a little more ancillary. We look at it and we're like, well, you know, we can't really, we know it's related, but it, is it directly related? OK, this is where we get into indirect costs, right? Cannot be cost effectively traced to a cost object, right? So think of the direct costs in my example with the candle, the glass, the wick, you know, the, the wax itself. Think of some of those indirect costs as and, and you can probably make think of some of those yourself, right? The Internet bill. Um, I'm sorry to go back. Um, the, you know, the 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 cost of the secretary, you know, the cost of the security guard at night. You know, some of the um, other indirect type costs that we may run into. So in their example, we've got bikes, right? So you can look at some of these for the bikes and you can say, yeah, you know, tires, seats, handlebars, cables, um, you know, these bike maker wages, you know, somebody that's working directly on those bikes. We'll sometimes call that direct labor, which we'll get to a little bit later in my lecture. 
Um, so yeah, you look at you look at these costs on the left where it says direct cost for bicycle, and you like um, you're probably going to be like, yeah, okay, I can see why those you know those are all direct costs for a bike. Then you look at some of the indirect costs, right? Factory accounting, factory ad admin, factory rent, so on and so forth. So those things are more like mm, you know they wouldn't just apply necessarily to like one bike or one you know model of bike, or maybe they're making tricycles as well as bikes. So then how do you you know how do you allocate these indirect costs? So the first thing to understand is direct versus indirect costs. Think of direct costs as we know it goes to this particular cost object. And again, don't let that term cost object confuse you. Just think about, okay, what, it, what are you building, right? In my example, if it's the candle, the candle is the cost object. If I'm, if I'm building this cup right here, which I'm drinking some coffee, then that would the cup itself would be the cost object, right? So don't, don't let these terms confuse you. Um, just some of them are a little, sound a little strange. Okay, so there's really two types of direct costs. We have direct materials and we have direct labor. So direct materials, um, these are costs for things for, for buying materials that can be cost effectively traced through the manufacturing process to finished goods. So the examples in manufacturing a bike, we'll just stick with their example, tires, you know, seats, pedals, brakes, frames, cables, again, things that directly go on a bike. Those are the materials, right? And then what about direct labor? <clears throat> so this is the second type of direct cost. Direct costs are always direct materials and direct labor. And then everything else gets put into another category called factory overhead, or sometimes just overhead, or they might call it manufacturing overhead. Um, but if you hear overhead, just think of something that didn't fit into the direct labor category or the direct material category. So direct labor, um, let's read through their definition. Direct labor costs are the wages and salaries for direct labor that are cost effectively traced through the manufacturing process to finished goods. So the example in manufacture of a bike would be wages paid to the bike assembly worker. So most of you have probably seen on TV or on you know social media or wherever on the computer, you, YouTube, you've probably seen these assembly lines, you know, stuff is moving down. Typically it's they always seem to show cars. And you've all, you know, you see those workers, so and so is putting on a steering wheel, somebody else is doing this, somebody else is doing that. Um, so you think of those people as direct labor, direct because we know, we know exactly what they are, what they're working on. And this is the sort of the third and, excuse me, final category, factory overhead. So this one consists of all manufacturing costs that are not direct materials or direct labor and cannot be cost effectively traced to finished goods. So examples, indirect labor would be maintenance workers, right? The maintenance workers could be working on the machines for you know, not just the bikes we're making, but maybe we're making tricycles too, or scooters or something else. And, you know, the maintenance workers are working on all these things, right? But we're paying these people money, right? We're paying them wages. So we still have to have a way to allocate those indirect costs. Indirect materials, things like screws, nuts, staples, things that you wouldn't necessarily use a lot of, are often categorized as indirect materials. And then any other indirect costs, factory utilities. We talked about, you know, like the the, the power, you know, the water, the um, internet bill, those those types of things. So again, just remember three categories: direct materials, direct labor, and then everything else is basically lumped into the factory overhead bucket um, of costs, if you will. All right, next thing: prime and conversion costs. So whenever you hear of this is really just terminology. Um, prime cost, whenever you hear that term prime, we're always talking about direct material and direct labor. So somebody said, if you were sitting in a meeting and somebody said prime cost, they just mean the material and the labor added together. That's it. For conversion costs, we're talking about labor and overhead. We're not talking about the material. You know, a good way to think of, a good way to remember this is that we're converting the material, right? So the conversion cost is you know what do you have to do to the material we have to have labor we have to have people um and then we may have factory well we will have factory overhead as well okay so just these two just the prime cost and conversion cost just a little bit of um terminology if you will now all three of these again the labor the direct labor direct material these two direct ones and then factory overhead the indirect one all three of these are combined um, that rep this, so this represents the total product cost, okay? 
So you notice right below it, they said period costs are non-production costs linked to a time period, not products. So we've basically got two types of costs. We've got product, which is we've got um, product costs, and then we've got period, we've got period costs. So period costs, again, think about the name like a period of time, right? Like a week or typically a month because accounting um, you know, cycles, um, financial statements typically run every month. You've probably heard the term like month end close, and that's because we're closing the books at the end of the month, ready for the next month. So whenever you hear period costs, look at some of the examples, uh, selling expenses, um, and then general and admin. So anytime you hear sell, you hear those terms, selling expenses, general and admin, those are costs that are just expensed out immediately on the income statement, right? They're not, we don't try to, what we call capitalize those. Um, the ones you see above, labor, material, and overhead, these are the product costs, okay? And then everything else um, is basically period costs, okay? So direct labor, direct material, factory overhead, those are your product costs, okay? Those, those costs are gonna flow through your inventory accounts and then will eventually be expensed through cost of goods sold as and as when you sell the product. And that's, the reason they do that, by the way, is you may remember learning about the, mat, the matching principle in, hopefully you learned about that in financial accounting, and it really just speaks to the matching principle, right? We've got, while you're making these products, you, you know, you're accumulating all these costs, right? The labor, the material, the overhead, but you don't have any revenue to match it with yet, right? Because you haven't sold it yet. So you kind of like for the labor, the material, the overhead, these product costs, they're going to be expensed, but they're going to be expensed through cost of goods sold once you sell the product. Because now, I'm sorry, you have revenue to match it with. With these period costs, it's not like that. We don't worry about that. We just say, okay, these are going to be expensed during this particular time period. And again, if you hear the term selling, general, or admin, those are going to be your period costs. So here's some examples of product versus period costs. So you can kind of look at the ones on the left, and you notice that the ones on the left really speak to production, right? They've got direct costs of production, and then we've got indirect stuff. Now, you notice for the indirect costs, for the product costs, you notice how every single one says factory. And then if you notice for the period costs, everything it like really just says um, office, right? Again, selling expenses, salespeople, advertising, promotions. Um, so think of like the direct cost and the indirect cost of product costs as it, you know directly or indirectly related to the factory itself. And then think of the period costs as, okay, we're not in the factory anymore. We're kind of in the you've probably like driven past the factory and you've you notice how they'll often have like a little office building attached to it. Um, that's going to be where the period costs are, right? That's going to be your secretarial, your admin, your selling, or all, all that kind of stuff. All right, reporting product and period costs in financial statements. Okay, so this is it looks a little confusing. It's not it's not as bad as it looks. So you see on the left we have year 2021 costs, right? And then they have up here, they have period costs, which again, they're not trying to capitalize those in the inventory accounts. They're just expensing those straight out. So anything that's, any period costs incurred in 2021 are just going to be expensed out in 2021, right? So again, you notice selling, general and admin. And then you notice if you come down here, you've got product costs for inventory. Now the inventory they sell in 2021, that's going to be expensed through cost of goods sold. Okay, so these are the product costs, right? Now they can expense them because they now have revenue to match it with. And then for inventory that's not sold in 2021, then they're going to basically add that. They're going to, the term we use is capitalize, right? Capitalize. We're going to stick it on the balance sheet. Why are we going to put it on our balance sheet? Well, because we haven't sold it yet, right? So whose asset is it before we sell it, right? It's ours. I say ours is in the companies, right? I mean, they don't want to keep it, right? They, they didn't produce it to keep it. They produced it to sell it. But it's their, it's their asset until they sell it. So it's basically sitting on their inventory. It's like our asset. Oh, wait, now we sold it, right? Inventory sold in 2022. And then now we can expense it through cost of goods sold. So just remember this, right? The product costs work their way through the inventory accounts. And they're ultimately expensed, we hope, because we want to sell them through cost of goods sold on the income statement in that period. Now, And the period costs... They're just expensed straight out in that period. We don't, we're not trying to capitalize those. We're not trying to add those to the balance sheet. We're just expensing those straight out. All right, reporting inventory on the balance sheet. So for a manufacturing firm, um, and this is what you see here, these three are really just for a manufacturing firm. 
different types of inventory. We've got raw material inventory. And we'll talk a little more about each of these in a second. Work in process inventory and finished goods. So think of this as kind of like chronological, like with an arrow going from left to right. So the company starts with raw materials inventory. Um, so think about like you're, you're a factory, right? You're a business, you're an enterprise, you buy raw materials you, and they arrive um, and they're kind of sitting in a stock room, a storeroom, waiting to be issued into the production line. Or I guess I should say onto the production line. That sounds better English. So materials waiting to be processed. So then they're like, okay, now we're ready to build some stuff, right? So think of work in process inventory. Anytime you hear that term, work in process, or we sometimes say like whip inventory, think of that as a production line. It's a good way, because that's exactly what it is. So we take stuff out of the raw materials inventory, we move it to the production line, whip inventory, and then we start building the stuff. So just like any production line, you know, the further through you, you know, the further along you are on the production line, you know, the, the more complete the units are, right? Um, and then as we're doing that, we're kind of adding materials and labor, right? You've seen, you've all seen those things working their way down the line, right? And people are adding stuff and then eventually it's going to be finished, right? It's going to be done at the end of the production line. We're kind of here and then we're like, okay, well, we may, we probably haven't sold it yet. We hope to sell it pretty soon. So we need somewhere to store it until we sell it. So it goes to finished goods inventory. So as it says, completed products ready for sale. Think of FGI. I, I just call it, I like to call it FGI, finished goods inventory. Think of that as like a warehouse. You got stuff that hasn't been sold yet. It's just waiting to uh, be sold. So here we see some differences in balance sheets, depending on whether they're a manufacturer, a merchandiser, or a service company. So the service company on the left here is pretty simple, right? They don't have an inventory account because if you're a service company, right? Think about like lawyers, you know, accountants, you know, if you're, if you're like a lawyer, right? You don't have inventory, right? You just go to court and represent people. You don't need an inventory account, right? So service companies, as you can see here, you don't see inventory, nor should you. For merchandising companies, um, and this is in the red here, so it kind of jumps out at you. They just have one. Think about what merchandising companies do, right? They do, they buy stuff, they resell it. The merchandising company in the middle here is not making stuff itself, right? They're just buying it. Think about all the shops, the stores you go to at the mall, right? American Eagle, you know, Hollister, you know, Shoe Show, any of those places. They're not making their own stuff, right? You know that. They're just buying it from other people. So they don't need all the inventory accounts, right? They just need one. They call it merchandise inventory or some variant of that. And this is where they uh, add their inventory that they've purchased. And then the, I say, I'm going to say the most complicated. I don't mean that like, because it's not complicated, but the most complex of the three is this one, the manufacturing company here on the right. And these, you can see here, the three inventory accounts that we just talked about, right? Raw materials, work in process and finished goods. So again, think of these chronologically, right? They get the materials that comes in. They've got some stuff that's, so think of this as like at any one time, right? They've got some stuff sitting in raw materials. They've got some stuff on the production line and they've got some stuff sitting in the warehouse. All right. So what about reporting costs on the income statement? So we don't really need to worry about that for the service company because again, there's no inventory, but for merchandising and manufacturing, um, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. It's just, uh, it's, it's more like terminology than it is anything else. So you can see they've got like for merchandising, we've got cost of goods sold. They've got their beginning inventory for merchandise, 14.2. And then plus whatever they purchased is the amount of stuff that they could sell. And then they take out um, what they've got left over. This is the merchandise in inventory ending. And then that must represent their cost of goods sold. And then you can see it's kind of the same thing here for um, the manufacturing company, right? They've got their beginning finished goods inventory. 11.2, and then 170 and some change of stuff that they've manufactured during the period. They add those two together, 181.7. That's the total amount of stuff that they could sell. And then they, okay, well, how much do we actually have in the finished goods inventory? We'll think about like the warehouse, 10,300. So the presumption is we must have sold the difference, right? The 171.4. So this is the flow of manufacturing activities. So kind of, again, you can kind of see the raw materials inventory and on the left here. Um, think about like the storeroom, the stock room we talked about. Work in process is all the production activity. Up, you can see in parentheses here, work in process is in the middle. And then finished goods is over on the right-hand side. 
so raw materials inventory beginning um and then they add their purchases so think of like what did you what raw materials did you have at the beginning of the month where did that come from well left over from last month right um so like the last day of june right all the workers go home they go home go to bed get up come back into work now it's july 1 so now the raw materials inventory beginning on july 1 is just from the last day of june right just the day before so I say that, maybe that's kind of obvious, but I say that because I want you to understand the connection between like ending inventory for one period and then beginning inventory for the next. Because it's it's really the same thing. It's just, you know, they went home, they went to bed, they got back up, came back into work. Now it's the first day of the next month. And then also whatever they purchased during the month. Okay. So then we have direct materials used. Um, that's now moving into, you know, the production line. So we start with the production line with what did they have? um on the production line at the beginning right work in process inventory beginning what materials did they add what labor did they use during the period and then what overhead did they use and again you notice the three things here we talked about right materials labor and overhead it's always those three things and then if we come over to finished goods think about the warehouse so you can see okay finished goods inventory beginning what was in the warehouse at the beginning and then what goods did they um, basically it says goods manufactured. Don't let that confuse you, because obviously they're not manufacturing it in the warehouse, right? What they're really what they're really saying there is what did they transfer over from goods that they manufactured on in the middle part, right? The assembly part is now being transferred over here to and, until such time as they sell it, right? And then you can see on the financial statements, right? You've got um, raw materials that like the unused materials. Again, it belongs on their balance sheet, right? Raw materials inventory. For the end of the month work and process inventory end of the month and finished goods inventory end of the month again those are your three when you for a manufacturing company right those are your three um in, uh, inventory accounts and it makes sense that you know all these things here at the end of the month you you still i say you like the the company still has them right so they they're owned by the company at that point the company doesn't want to keep them right they want to manufacture and sell it that's the whole point right but until such time as they do sell stuff it does belong on their balance sheet because it is their asset, okay? And then you can see here, we've got, if you come across, you've got things that were unfinished and then were finished, were transferred over to the warehouse. And then you can see stuff that was sold, right? Goes to cost of goods sold. All right, so let's take a quick look at a schedule of cost of goods manufactured, okay? So this summarizes the types and amounts of costs incurred in a company's manufacturing process. So all we have to do here, it's, it's, it's fairly simple once you get the hang of it. We just add our materials, our labor, and our overhead, which is gonna give us our total manufacturing costs. You've heard me say, right, materials, labor, overhead. It's always those three things. And then we add our beginning working process, like what did we have at the beginning? And then we subtract um, what's left, you know, our ending working process. What's basically sitting there at the end of the period, not finished yet, but we're gonna have to finish next next period. And that is going to give us our cost of goods manufactured. So you can kind of see here, um, you know, we've got our direct materials. We've got our direct labor. We've got our factory overhead. Um, so you can kind of, if you want to pause the video here and just kind of look through these, you can kind of see, you know, we've got uh, our, di our direct labor, 60,000. We've got materials used, 85.5. And then we've got our uh, factory overhead down here. Right, total factory overhead thirty thousand. They've got their total manufacturing cost one seventy five five, which is the eighty five five. Add the sixty, and then add the thirty. That's going to give you again the materials, uh, the labor, the sixty, and the overhead. Right of thirty. So that's going to give you your total manufacturing cost, the one seventy five five, materials, labor, and overhead. And then just like the formula said, you add your beginning working process inventory twenty five hundred. You get one seventy eight. Those two added together. And then you just subtract your ending work in process inventory because that's going to be finished the next period. And we have cost of goods manufactured of, oh, sorry, 170,500. So if you want to, if you want to pause the video here, just kind of take a minute just to go over these numbers. All these numbers in this example were given to you, by the way. You didn't have to calculate these. So don't, don't be freaking out or thinking, okay, I have no idea where they got like the 86.5 of raw materials. They, they gave you these numbers. Okay. This is just to, give you an introduction to the schedule of cost of goods manufactured. All right. 
So let's take a look at um, the manufacturing cost flows across accounting reports. So you, this is what we just looked at here, the schedule of the cost of goods manufactured, right? And then you can, this, is, this was the 175. I'm not saying that right, I guess 170,500 would be a better way to say that. And then you can see for um, the income statement, they've got the cost of goods manufactured here, 170,500. So they just let you know that that belongs on the income statement, okay? And then they have finished goods um, ending, which is here, which is coming from the uh, balance sheet. So you can see here, they've got the arrow going from work in process at the end of the period. That's the, think of the work in process ending as the stuff that's sitting on the assembly line at the end of the month that isn't finished yet, that's going to be finished the next period, typically the next month. They're just letting you know for that, that's going to go on the balance sheet because the company still has it. And you can see the blue arrow, it goes to working process inventory, 7,500. And then you can see they got raw materials inventory again. That was right off of that other schedule of cost of goods manufactured. And then they have finished goods inventory of 10,300, which of course is pulled uh, right from there. All right, we'll talk real, just, I just want to give you a real quick, real brief introduction to JIT, just-in-time manufacturing. You may or may not have heard of this. This is kind of a Japanese um, Kaizen type thing. Um, the idea here is that they don't have a lot of ma like material on hand, like stuff is coming in just in time. As you see, right, receive customer orders, schedule the production, receive materials just in time for production. That's kind of risky because what if, you know, a truck overturns or, you know, a train derails and you don't get your stuff? Some companies will keep some safety stock to, you know, kind of abate that. The idea is you complete products just in time to ship to customers and everything is completed just in time, right? So the idea here is it cuts down on your inventory storage costs um, and it's, it is cheaper, it's leaner, but again, it does come with um, a little more, a little more risk. Yeah, the other thing I want to make sure we talked about again, just, just briefly, just to give you a kind of an overview was the, uh, the value chain. So think of the value chain as, as it, we'll, we'll read their definition uh, first. The value chain refers to the series of principles that add value to a company's products or services. Companies can use lean principles to increase efficiency and profits. So think about like in this example, the baking, right? So they acquire, the baker requires the raw materials, the, the oil, the eggs, the flour, etc. probably some sugar. They bake it and then they sell it. And then, you know, they, they're able to provide a, a service in that sense. So as you're working your way through, they're kind of adding more costs, right? We think of the value chain as um, in logistics, they kind of talk more about the supply chain and accounting. We, we're really talking about roughly the same thing, but we, we call it the value chain. The idea is that we're kind of, which things are working its way through the process from getting to the beginning of the process all the way through to the end, which of course is the customer. Um... And it's, you know, as we do, we're just, you know, value value is being added, costs are being added and increased, right? Um, like the cost of the raw materials are here, but then once we get to the baker, the baker's got to think about his or her wages have to be added in. There may be costs associated with sales. So as you're working your way through the value chain, sort of like left to right, you're increasing, increasing costs. All right, the last thing, and then we're done. Uh, just real quick, raw materials inventory turnover. So this is a ratio. So we calculate this by taking the raw materials used, dividing it by the average raw materials inventory. Um, and the, the average is just what we do is we just look on the balance sheet from a year ago. We look at the balance sheet from the one, the most recent one. And then we just, we take the inventory amounts and then we just divide it by two just to try to get like a smooth average inventory for the year. Okay. So raw materials, and again, these numbers were just given to you. So don't worry about that. So the raw materials inventory turnover was calculated as they used 85,500 of raw materials. Um, and then the beginning materials inventory was 8,000. So think of like they got that from the balance sheet a year ago under current assets. And then they looked at this most recent balance sheet, 9,000 divided it by two. So obviously that'd be 8,500. So think about 85,5 divided by 8,500 yet would be 10.1. So what's, what does that mean? What does the 10.1 mean? It just means that they basically are turned, they turned over, they cycled their inventory 10.1 uh, times during the year. And obviously, the, really the quicker the better, right? Especially with inventories that are perishable, like they go bad quick. Um, you know, if you're a baker, if you're selling flowers, you know, things that go bad quick, milk, bread and milk, right? Um, we do, we're, we're very concerned, we're more concerned about um, 
you know, especially concerned about inventory turnover because the stuff is going to be perishable, it's going to go bad quick, and then we're not going to be able to sell it. So think of this as kind of the higher, the better. And then finally, day sales in raw materials inventory. So this is the exact same thing. That as Let me go back as that. Here we're just looking at the expressing it in the number of days. So you can see here it says 10.1, right? So here um, they've, they've taken, again, they've, set, they've done it slightly differently. Um, you could do it this way too. Um, or you could just take 365 and just divide it by 10.1. And it's going to give you the 38.4. Um, so you can, do, you can do it either way. So it's like saying, okay, our inventory, we, turn, we, we cycle our inventory just over 10 times every year. Or you could say we cycle our inventory about every 38.4 days, roughly speaking. Okay, that's everything from this chapter. Um, so I will talk to you all soon. Take care.